live on YouTube there now. We're going to go live on Facebook next. Did you send him a message? Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're live now. And just waiting for us to simulcast here, folks, uh, across the, the network. And it looks like we're good. So, good evening, folks, and uh, welcome to the page. It's uh, Chris Kerwin here, and I've got Paul Owen with me in uh, Hampton. Mike was called away. We're not sure what happened there, but uh, I'm sure uh, I'm hoping he, everything's okay. So, uh, we're going to go ahead with the show uh, anyway, and maybe he might drop in uh, with us a little bit later on, possibly. So, uh, good evening. Uh, Paul Owen here again from Hampton, and myself uh, from St. John, and uh, we're going to bring you our Sunday night astronomy show issue here. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about um, telescopes. I'm sorry. We're not going to, yeah, we are going to talk about telescopes. I'm just trying sure to get, get my screen up to <laughs> full size here so we got everything. There we go. There. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are going to talk about telescopes. You're right. And uh, we're going to talk about how to uh, take that special shot of the moon. Um, right now, I've got a, a moon contest going on on my Facebook page. So asking for people to submit photos to us and in regards to um, the, the moon and uh, Venus and whatever else you see out there. But mostly the moon. And uh, I've got, I think, over, I think about 60 photos so far, which is 60 entries so far, which is great for just a couple of nights. And so uh, my uh, contest ends on April the 10th. And uh, in the meantime, I've got Paul here with us who's going to show us how to do that uh, sweet capture of the moon and how to process the photo and how to get those uh, amazing shots that he gets. So, Paul, I'm going to head back over to you. And I'm going to make sure we're clicked on you here, so on both screens, which we are. So right now I'm simulcasting on YouTube and Facebook both. So if you see my head popping around in two screens, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. It's it's me and me. So uh, yeah, we're just gonna we're gonna try this uh, this uh, format for tonight and uh, see if I can uh, continue to to simulcast on both uh, on both uh, platforms tonight. Well, so, you're kind of taking Mike's spot, so the, so the I am. three of us there. That's yeah. right. You're just <laughs> yeah. going in for Mike. You're, you do a lot of things. Yeah. You balance all these computers, you get stuff all ready, and now you're doing two different personalities. So you're, you're, you're an amazing man. The split personality <laughs> guy, yeah. <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde right there. That's it. <laughs> all righty. We'll get you to go ahead there, Paul. Uh, right. And uh, I'm going to keep an eye on our Facebook and YouTube comments as, as you're going. Let me get my mouse in the right spot. There we go. Okay, you go ahead. You all set? I, okay. think, we're, I think we're set. Okay, so uh, tonight um, I just want to just talk, do a little brief talk on, um, you know, what it takes to take a moon picture. Because as Chris said uh, just a minute ago, he's in the middle of uh, doing uh, another one of his great contests where he's going to give away a telescope and some binoculars and some other wonderful prizes to some people who are submitting some photos. But a lot of people may think, you know, I would really like to do that, but I don't know how. You know, how can I take a picture of a moon and send it to you? So um, I'm, tonight I'm going to try and dispel a lot of that and just give you some real basic uh, ideas of what you can do uh, to take some just, moon pictures, um, whether you're using your cell phone or whether you're using a... a you know, uh, a spotting scope if you're a birder, if, if you're using, uh, if you do have a telescope, how to hook it up and take that picture and that kind of stuff. So those are the things that um, um, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of chat with you about. Um, the nice thing about taking moon photographs or even sun photographs, but I'll kind of clump them into one, but moon photographs especially, is first of all, it's really, really easy to do because it's the brightest thing in the sky. Um, You've got about, I don't know how many days in a month we have the moon. It's 20 some days, 21 days, I think. So there's 21 opportunities to take pictures and practice, uh, you know, with that moon. And the nice thing is that sometimes the moon's up in the daytime and sometimes the moon's up at night. Um, so there's all kinds of different opportunities for you to practice with your camera, if that's what you're going to use. Um, if you do have a little telescope, it's, uh, it's big enough in the sky. If your finder and your telescope is lined up with your, uh, your finder scopes lined up with your telescope, then, then it's really, really easy to find and it's, you know, it's easy to take a picture of it. Because unlike deep sky imaging where you take, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours of one picture, um, you can do this in a, mat in a fraction of a second. Um, so you don't have to worry about setting up with um, um, German equatorial mounts. You don't have to worry about doing three-star alignments. Um, you can do it in the middle of the city. So it, you don't have to go to a dark sky site because the moon is so bright that you could be downtown Toronto 
and take photographs of the moon. And in fact, that would be kind of cool because you have some really cool uh, uh, nightscapes that you'd, uh, or cityscapes rather, you could use uh, for your photograph. Um, so, and, this, and speaking of which, there's a, a lot of things you can do. A lot of my photographs are not just pictures of the moon and that's it, but I've got a lot of, um, a lot of landscape um, pictures of either moon rising or moon setting. Um, one of our photos we're gonna see tonight from one of our St. John astronomy um, members, Alec, uh, it shows conjunctions, you know, all of these things can be done very, very, very easily um, with, you know, with some simple things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of start with um, cell phone pictures, because I think it's one that most of us have a cell phone. And um, so even if you don't have a telescope of your own, um, that kind of stuff, you can, with, with some of the cameras today, they've got some good zoom features on them. So you can zoom right in, and if you want to take and hold your camera up now, I mean, they've even got on these cell phones, and I'll just take mine out and I'll use that as a prop, but even on the cell phones today, they've got um, stabilization on them. So when you're taking a picture, you know, depending on how you're doing it, taking a picture, you can push a button, and then instead of getting all this shake, things are just nice and smooth, so you can take a really, really... Uh, nice picture. Cell phones are absolutely wonderful for taking uh, nightscape shots. If you're down like Chris and myself and Mike spend a lot of time, more Chris and Mike than me, but spend a lot of time at Saints Rest Beach and the sun, uh, the moon rises over that bay are just, they're just stunning. And there's been, you know, I'm sure millions of people taking photographs of it because it's just so photogenic. But with one of these, you just go down there and let's say Chris and Mike are down there one night. Well, just get in front of them while they're looking through their telescope and while you're watching the moon come up over the bay. What a great photo op that would be. And you can do that with your cell phone. Just take the picture. Um, most cell phones have um, uh, what they call um, a sensitivity or an ISOs uh, settings on the camera. So when you're doing a photograph like that, you just want to make your camera as sensitive as possible. So choose some of those higher ISO numbers. And, uh, and you'll find that your, um, your night shots will turn out great. Or a lot of these cameras now just have what they call night mode. So you can put it on night mode and you can take some, some great photographs. Some of the cameras today even have time lapses built in so you can do wonderful time lapses. So a cell phone is one great way to do it. Now, let me just show you a few of the ways you can use it. So for example, if you're, um, if you're somebody who's out um, and likes to take a lot of, um, or likes to just enjoy um, watching the birds or watching your neighbors, <laughs> whatever you want to watch <laughs> with, um, with a spotting scope. These things are absolutely wonderful because basically what they do, um, I'm just going to take this device off for a minute, is a spotting scope really, it's a telescope. It really is. Or it's a monocular type of binocular. Um, but with this, I mean, you can take and, um, aim this instead of looking at daytime stuff, you can basically aim it up at the moon like you would a telescope. You can buy these for 30, 40, 50 dollars. They're pretty inexpensive to buy. They've got a zoom feature on them so you can zoom anywhere from 40 to 70 times or somewhere, they're 20 to 60 on this one, 20 to 60 times. Um, and then once you get a really nice sharp focus, then you can go and get one of these rigs. Chris uses one of these all the time and uh and uh we kind of discovered these i don't know about a year ago chris yeah about like that. that yeah yeah so about a year ago we discovered the, that these things because chris was looking for something that was more robust than what he had been using and this is made by a company called celestron and um basically it's designed to take your cell phone and take pictures uh through a telescope but if you've got a little um, spotting scope like this one then all you do is take your phone and you can put like up to almost a tablet in these things. You know, they're so versatile. So your phone just goes in like that. I'll just get a little closer so you can see. And it just grabs your phone. Once it's grabbed your phone, then on the back side of this, there's three buttons that can give you movement. So there's this one on the bottom. And as you can see, I'll just it's moving the phone either back or, back or forth. This one moves the phone sideways. And then this one moves the phone up or down. 
And the reason it has all that flexibility is because you don't, they don't know what you're going to be hooking onto for a telescope. So all you do is there's this little clamp system you see right here. So you just loosen that up a little bit so it'll fit around the eyepiece. And then you're going to see right in your camera phone where your camera is. So all you do is you line up your camera with the, uh, the back of the the back of the scope. So if I was digiscoping and maybe I was the one, I'm just want to practice in the daytime just to see, you know, get my focus and learn how to do this. Then maybe I'll just go out to uh, say one of the parks and maybe look at some birds and stuff or find something that's even not moving something still. And then you just take this and you just mount it right over your eyepiece. Once you get it mounted on the eyepiece, then you just take that little orange button and that'll clamp onto it really nice and tight. And then once you get it basically there, then the rest is really simple. I'll turn it sideways so you can see what I'm going to do. So right now I'm too far away from that. Let me see if I can move my chair out of the way here for a second. Let me get this in a little closer so you can see that better. So right now I'm a little far away from that. So if I needed to get closer on that, well then this button you see down here on the other side, the one I was showing up and down, you see I can put my cell phone right as close as I need to, to find focus. And Paul, then, yeah. Uh, maybe just tilt your camera up a little bit. Yeah, all you can see is your mouth. <laughs> there we go. There, perfect. Sorry. That's okay. There, there we perfect. go. So, um, uh, so, yeah, so basically, so this will move. There we go. It's a better angle. So this will move uh, the, the, cam, uh, the cell phone in and out. Once you got it kind of in and out, and you still don't see it in your in your field of view. Well, then these buttons down here will move your phone either up and down or side to side. And once you've got that perfectly lined up, then your image is going to come right through here on your screen. Once you've got the image that you want, you can either, if you have a little self timer, you can tap it. Or most most of the things like if you're going to um, if you're going to see Chris or somebody at the beach or somebody's got a scope, they're usually pretty firm. So you can hit them and they're not going to shake and all that kind of stuff. But basically you just touch them very gently and then snap. There's your picture. It's just that simple. Um, so you can use that device on the, on, um, on uh, a spotter scope like this one. Let me just take this off again. There we go. So if you have a spotting scope, it works absolutely wonderful. If you have a telescope at home, Or if you know someone who's got one, I'll bring this over a little bit. There, can you see that? Yeah. I'm sorry oh. for having, it's a small room I'm in. <laughs> well, I've just got one question here. Somebody was asking about where can you get one of those Celestron XYZ adapters? And, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so. um, we, you can get them at any one of the... Um, uh, vendors who sell um, astronomical supplies. Hmm. We got these ones from a place called Learla Nature, which is now called Astronomy Plus in Montreal. And fantastic guy up there, Stefan, uh, is an amazing guy, and we do a lot of business with him. But you can go to anybody that you want to. They have them all across the country. Um, if you don't know where to find them, you can go to um, uh, a site called Astro Buy Sell. And right on the top of the Astro Buy Sell page, all the Canadian retailers for uh, telescope products are right up there. So you can just basically start clicking on them if you want to compare prices, see what they've got, you know, have a look at whatever is out, the newest, latest, greatest thing that's out of there. But that's where you can get these. And it's, again, you just type in Celestron Canada uh, and you could probably get there too. But if you type in, what's this called, Chris? The YY? So Celestron Next YZ. Next YZ, that's yeah. it. They're so if you about... type in Celestron, yeah. Sorry. If yeah, you type in Celestron next YZ and then in Canada, then it'll take you to all the Canadian retailers for this. Yeah, they run around 70 bucks or so for that one, that particular one. But I've tried many different models. Uh, I've had a lot of people, of course, come by the telescope and, and I've tried to offer them a, a, an idea of getting a photo of the moon through the telescope. And I've tried several different models. I actually wore out two of them, um, two, two, <laughs> two other types, just... I mean, they're complete wore out from just so many people uh, grabbing a photo. But that one there uh, is so great because it does allow you to uh, change to adjust with all three axes. Also, there's uh, some tension points there too on the on that as well, uh, yeah. Paul. Right? Yeah. Like the yeah, screws, that's right. Yeah. 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 So on the back of this, um, 
there's a there's a few uh, there's a couple of small little areas that you can put a screwdriver into. Mm. So if you find your actions a little bit too loose, you can tighten it up. Mm. Or if over time, uh, because they do over time with a lot of use, tend to loosen up like anything else does. So so you can actually adjust them to keep them nice and firm. So it's not like they've worn out and you got to throw them away. They yeah. do uh, they have considered that they do need to be adjusted. So yeah. So those ones that have the pop sockets on the back of the phones, I find that they they won't work on that. Like you've got to take that off or the case off or whatever. But when you have the phone yeah. just like that for sure, it, it yeah. It works yeah, yeah. These these ones, like in, in, from the ones that I've seen, these are the best ones I've seen out there so far. Yeah. Okay. So to use this on a telescope, it's exactly the same thing as if you were going to use it on a spotting scope. So basically, you just take and loosen this up. And keep in mind now, you can use this. This is uh, on this telescope. What I'm going to demonstrate here. This is a one and a quarter inch eyepiece, but you can use you can use this right up to a two inch eyepiece. So if you've got those big robust uh, eyepieces. Uh, this this clamp can be loosened up to take right up to a two inch IP. So um, so no fear, no matter which kind of rig that you have. So basically, it's the same thing. You just put it over the eyepiece. Once you got it on the eyepiece, like that on the telescope. Chances are the telescope is already pointed at uh, whatever it is you want to look at. And we always recommend that first if you're doing this on your own. Find your target, get it in the center uh, view of your telescope, so that when you put your cell phone on it. You're not going to be fighting with where's the, where's the target. It's already there. You just got to you just got to play with uh, those adjusters uh, on the on the clamp itself and and find whatever your product or your your target is. So basically, once it's on your telescope, again, do the same adjustments on it. Once you got it where you want it, just simple little push on it and snap away. You can get beautiful pictures of the moon. Uh, if somebody's got a solar filter on the front of that, uh, pictures of the sun. Um, uh, I've seen Chris take many pictures of Jupiter and its moons all lined up for people. Fantastic uh, uh, images of Saturn. And all of that can be done with your cell phone in a simple clamp like that. Um, anyway, I, I, it's just wonderful that way. Yeah, I've, I've used that uh, whenever anybody has watched one of my Facebook Live videos. That's exactly what I'm using right there uh, with my phone in that NextYZ adapter. Uh, and I've done, I don't know, a hundred or two, <laughs> at least a hundred, oh I guess, God. Facebook <laughs> lives. Can't, can't remember a, how many a times. Lot. A lot of, yeah. yeah. And it works It yeah. works very well for that. I mean, you've got your audio when I'm down at St. Stress Beach. I've got the, the ocean waves coming in as, I'm, as we're all watching the moon together. So really nice yeah. like that too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one way that you can do it. Um, an another way you can do it, of course, is if you have a, a DSLR, and I think I actually got one set up yeah, right here. So I'm just going to move this telescope away for a minute. Ah, too big to carry for me, my little, my old body. So then we have just like a regular uh, type of a camera. So again, depending on what you want to do, um, if you're taking pictures of, um, of a moon rise, um, if you're taking pictures of a moon set, and all of that kind of stuff, then you don't want to use a big long life uh, lens like this one. You'd want to use, I don't have one right here in, at, the, at my grip, but you'd want to use as short of focal length um, lenses you can get, like an 18 millimeter, 14 millimeter, something along those lines. So if you're looking at, say, say if you're fortunate enough and you're able to go out west, say out to the Rockies or something like that, um, and then you've got that beautiful mountain range in the background. Well, you don't want to cut that off. You want to really get as much of that as you can, because typically uh, at nighttime, uh, a lot of the, depending on the time of the year, a lot of those mountains are snow capped. And then if you get the moon, the moon glowing off those snow caps, I mean, it's just a fantastic image. So to be able to do that and do it and get a nice shot of everything, well, then you'd want to use a wider, a wider angle lens. If you want to get something that's really um, detailed on the surface of the moon, maybe the moon, um, you know, actually going right into uh, the horizon, maybe there's a mountain and the moon's actually setting right into the horizon, then you get up nice and close and look how sharp and jagged those rock edges are, or those nice tree lines with that, that big bright moon in behind it, that can make an absolutely fantastic fix, uh, picture as well. And if that's what you're going for, well, then you're going to want to use a very long focal length. You want something that's going to get you right in there, get you up nice and close and give you all that detail that you want. So, um, so again, using a, a, a DSLR, uh, camera, uh, or it doesn't even have to be a DSLR, it could be a mirrorless, whatever the case. So long as what you're using has a variety of focal lengths, you can spend months and years taking photographs just like this, and a lot of people do. Because not only can you do the moon, you can do um, conjunctions, you can do constellations, uh, you can do Milky Way shots, 
Uh, you can leave it out doing time lapses and get all kinds of nice shooting stars in there, meteorites, or meteors, and so on and so forth. Uh, or if you want to see those Starlink things. You know? Yeah, I was just going to mention that. All kinds of satellites. 30,000 of them. Yeah. Our link to the universe. Yeah, yeah sure. Anyway, so um, so with a DSLR, um, you know, again, the, um, the possibilities are endless in terms of what you can do uh, that way. So that's another way that you can take pictures of the moon. And, uh, and of course what a lot of people think when they see these fantastic photographs of the moon is they're automatically thinking, okay, I saw someone take a picture of the moon. They must have been through a telescope because the detail on the craters and so on and so on. And if that's what you're looking to do, then of course there's a myriad of ways you can do that. So um, the first way to do it, um, if, uh, I guess you could, uh, actually I'm, I'm skipping ahead, sorry, is you can take that same DSLR and I have another one here I'll show you. So you can take your DSLR camera and what you're going to do is take off the lens. Okay. So now you get the lens off, then you're going to simply pop the cap off. Now you've got the sensor here opened up and then you're going to take what they call a T ring or T adapter. Now this one's not made for this camera, but basically, do I have one that is? Yes, I do. Just one sec. So, uh, and I'm kind of glad I'm actually showing you this because this is very important. So what you're going to have to buy that's actually native to your camera is what they call the T-ring. And what this T-ring is, this basically, if you look at the back, if, you look, if you've got a, one of your lenses and you look at the back of your lens, you can see the kind of configuration and the, you know, the, the rig they've got that actually lets you plug that into your camera. So if this, um, um, it, so this is what goes into your camera body. So when you take this off and you, you have to actually put something back in there so that you're able to connect this to a nose piece. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So once you've taken the lens off, now you've got this, um, you've got this uh, configuration here that needs to have an adapter on it. And this is what's called a T adapter right here. So for my Canon camera, I have to buy, you can see that up there, I have to buy a Canon T ring. If I had a Nikon camera, um, it's here somewhere. Anyway, I'd have to get a Nikon T ring. Or if I had uh, an Olympus camera, then I would have to get an Olympus T-ring. So, so anytime you're going to have to get one of these T-rings, you have to buy one that's made for your camera. Anyway, so all that does, that clicks on the same way that your lens would click in. So now you've got the T-ring on. Now all you got to do is put a nose piece on it. And what is a nose piece? Well, here's the Nikon T-ring here. It was on the nose piece I was going to show you. So that one there, of course, will be for Nikon. So you, th these are the only things you have to buy that are proprietary. So, um, so this is what they call a nose piece, and this is what's going to slide into the telescope. But this is how you're going to connect this to the camera. So you just take this nose piece, and it's got a what they call a T42 thread system on it. And that just goes on your camera, and there. So now your camera is all ready to slide into the telescope, and I'll show you how to do that. So if your scope's already set up or somebody else's is, and you want to take a picture, then the work they're going to do is they're going to take out their eyepiece. And this is where your eyepiece and diagonal and all that stuff go. That goes in this end of the telescope. So we take that out. Then we take our camera. And then our camera, can you see that? Yep. Our camera just slides right into that place. And then we just simply lock it in place. So now... With camera in hand, on the telescope, telescope's already pointed at your object. All you have to do now is if you have a live view on your screen, you can kind of tilt that to wherever you want, but um, is basically just turn on your camera, make a few adjustments. So depending on what you're shooting, if you're shooting, uh, say, a full moon, 
well, you're going to want to have a very low light sensitivity because the moon's very bright. But on the other hand, if you're shooting a very thin crescent moon, then you're going to have to crank up the sensitivity because that's a very faint thing to look at. So, um, but all of those things will come with a little bit of practice and maybe down the road we'll do, um, we'll do a talk on actual camera settings and all that kind of stuff. So this is, um, this is another way that you can get um, those shots at the moon. So that would be through a DSLR camera. And typically you're going to shoot um, single shots with this. Maybe a bunch you can shoot in, in variety and then, then you can stack them. Or if you want to shoot a movie, you can. But the thing is, with a camera like that, you're going to go through your memory card like that with video and that resolution unless you shoot JPEG, right? So that's another way that you can do it. Um, and then once you've got your, uh, your, um, your imaging taken care of, there's two ways you can get it to your computer. Number one is each of these cameras has a little memory chip. And everybody's seen these little memory sticks. And so the camera, this just slides into your camera, and this is how much memory you have. This one happens to be 8 gigabyte, but you can get them, you know, 32, 128, you know, whatever you want, really. And anytime you're doing this, I always recommend get the largest that you can get because you never know how many pictures you're going to end up taking. Uh, so that's one way you can do it. The second way you can do it is if you're a little bit more savvy with this stuff. Um, you can actually hook up um, a program, a software um, on your computer, and it's called uh, uh, um, Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon. And basically what it is, it's a software program developed by a software programmer who also was into astrophotography, and he wanted to be able to use his camera to do all these kind of long exposure um, uh, uh, photography, like for nebulas and all that kind of stuff. It takes a lot more complicated uh, things to set up. But you can take this and plug the camera directly right into your computer, and then have your comp you can operate it right from your computer if you want to. So that's a couple of ways that you can you can operate with the DSLR to get some nice uh, some nice moon photographs. Thirdly, um, and my favorite way to get pictures of the moon lately is using what they call a high frame rate camera. And this is uh, a camera that's designed um, by a company called ZWO. And this is the uh, ASI120. This one's actually monochromatic, but you can get these in color. So if you want to shoot in color or black and white, it doesn't matter. If you're only shooting the moon, Realistically, you don't need to shoot in color. You can shoot in black and white because typically most people, that's what they think the moon is back to black and white. There, in fact, is colors up there, but they're very, very um, subtle. And some people are actually able to bring out those nice uh, variety of colors on the moon. But if you're just getting started in this, then I won't recommend thinking about that yet. Just kind of get a really good camera like this that has a very high frame rate. And then basically what you do with this this one happens to have a um, a little, I was using this in my observatory to look at the sky. It's an all sky camera. So it's a very, like a fisheye lens on it. But you unscrew that fisheye lens and then you put on basically another nose piece. It'd be just like this. So this would be on the, basically on the front of the camera that would go into there. And then you would take that camera and you would plug it in the same way that I just showed you how you plug in your DSLR. The advantage to this is, is couple fold actually, is um, it'll get you a lot more, a lot closer detail on the moon. And the reason it does, it's not because it's zooming in or doing anything like that. It's because the chip size is so small. When you look at a chip, well, I actually can't show you on this one. Maybe I can. Yeah, I can get the camera out, or the lens out. There we go. So if you look at this, I'm going to show you how tiny that little chip is in there. So it's not real big. And the whole point behind using a small chip like this when you're shooting anything that's planetary, solar, or anything like that, is so that um, you're filling the chip. And you're, you're not just, you don't have just one little spot on a, on a big lens like you would, say, on this DSLR. I'll show you what I mean by that. So if you look at this DSLR, I don't know if I got a battery in this or not. There we go, locked the mirror up. So look how big that chip is. I'll get back a little further so that I can focus. And then look how big that chip is. And you can see like those things are like day and night in the physical size. 
So if I'm shooting something that's huge, you know, like a large nebula, a couple of galaxies I want to get in the same frame, that kind of stuff, I'll use this one. But if I want to get really up close and personal, say Jupiter or Saturn, the moon, the sun, um, I'll choose the right telescope that will match this, but I can actually fill that whole frame. And, uh, and I'm filling it because it's quite a bit smaller, so it doesn't take as much um, uh, f of, uh, focal length to fill it. And at the same time, um, I'm using all the pixels that are in there. So when I put that on my on my screen, it's automatically big and full and lots of detail. If I put that same image on the same telescope in the camera, because the, because its sensor is so big, it would be like the, the tip of my finger in a corner is how small that would be. So I'd have to really crop that in big before you could even see anything. But by the time you get it to there, you've lost all your resolution. So that's the whole idea behind using something like this. Now, this one is what they call a, a high frame rate camera. So at the same time, um, because it's such a small chip and your resolution or, or the physical uh, data that's going from the camera into the computer is so much smaller, um, I can download, and I, I actually did the math on it, I can download um, 30 frames in a second. I, I, you can do actually 120 on some cameras, but just for one, for better words and, and for demonstration purposes, I did this the other night when Chris and I were on, on air and um, it took me 30 seconds. I had 900 frames, 30 Crazy. seconds. Crazy. Crazy. So you can go out there. If your scope's already set up, you do it in the daytime, uh, you, you know where the moon's going to be. You can go out Stellarium, find out where the moon's going to be. Get your scope set up. So when the moon starts to show itself uh, at night, that part's out of the way. Take your camera it, or put your eyepiece in first, your diagonal, right? You've got that in your telescope. You find the moon. I'm just going to give you a, a quick uh, workflow, show you how fast it is. Take your, to get your eyepiece in there, it's centered on the moon. Now you're centered on the moon, scope is done and out of the way. Take the eyepiece out, put the camera in. You're going to have to do a little adjustment on focus because your eyepiece will focus at a different point than the camera will. And then get your focus all set up on the camera. Once you're all set up with your focus on the camera, um, if I'm using this little guy, then I have a, 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 a planetary software program in my little laptop. Then I just, I got it open. I can see there's the moon. I'll make a few slider adjustments so the moon's clear. It's not blown out. It's not too dark. Nice, nice, even look. And then I'll just press a button. And in 30 seconds, I'm going to have 900 frames. Once I've got those 900 frames, then I simply go into a planet or into a stacking software called either Auto Stacker or Reggie Stacks, whichever your preference is. And you can stack those up within two or three minutes. Now they're all stacked and they're ready to go. If you did it in Reggie Stacks, well, you just saved a step because you're already in there and that's where the best sharpening tools are. So you take your Reggie Stacks, you do a quick sharpening on it. It looks nice, sharp, crisp, save the file. Goes into your computer. Now it's on your computer. It's all saved. There it is, beautiful picture. Throw it into Photoshop, make a couple of adjustments on it so it looks nice and crisp and clean the way that you like it, and you're done. So because I've got the observatory in the backyard, if somebody wanted a moon picture, if the moon was already up, I could go out there, get the moon, do all of this stuff, give an absolutely wonderful moonshot, I bet you in less than 15 minutes. So it doesn't take all that much time to do once you get used to the procedure, because once you do it once, you do the same thing every time. It's just a, a very repetitive kind of a function, but it's just learning how to get the steps, that's all. And we can cover a lot of that stuff in some of the upcoming shows. But So that would be done um, basically with... Um, with uh, the uh, the high frame rate camera. Um, there is one other camera that we use, uh, I keep in the observatory, and it's made by the same company, ZWO, and it's called the ASI 294, and it's a, it's a one-shot color camera, so it's not a monochrome like that one, where you gotta use different filters and all that stuff if you wanna get something in color. Uh, but um, what that camera does is, not only can you take deep space, uh, images with it, but you can also do what we just talked about here. You can do uh, fast frame rate um, uh, um, moon and sun and you know solar uh, imaging with it. So there are cameras that that are sort of a one-stop shop that'll do a lot of it for you. The only difference between that camera and using, say, your cell phone camera or your uh, DSLR uh, over there, is that with those cameras. Um, 
they've got built in everything. So as soon as you take the picture, all you need to do is bring a camera and then you, you can go ahead and take your pictures. If you've got a big enough lens like I do on this one uh, and a tripod, you don't need any any uh, computers at all because every all your monitoring, all your memory, all your pictures so you can look back at it, it's all right there. You can review it right on the spot. With the other types of cameras that I talked about, the webcam style or uh, the deep sky camera that does double duty, you have to have a separate computer for that. So you have to take a laptop. So it's more cumbersome. So uh, if I'm getting started in the moon picture um, uh, uh, hobby, start with a cell phone, uh, do some digiscoping, kind of get used to, you know, settings and ideas, you know, what the moon's actually like for brightness. If you already have a DSLR, pop it on a tripod, see if you can borrow, a, a, if you don't already have one, a zoom lens from a friend. And, um, and, and, you know, we're going to cover some stuff on settings to use for that. And uh, you can get some nice settings and that kind of stuff. If you know someone like Chris, Mike, or me, who's got telescopes, and we just love to have people come over and throw whatever they got into our scopes, whether it be a DSLR or a, um, a cell phone camera, whatever you got, throw it at us and we'll make sure you get a picture when you leave. Yeah. So uh, anything like that. So um, there's a lot of ways to, to kind of go about this. And, um, but there's a lot of simple ways. And, and basically some of the things I talked about in the, free, in the beginning of the night with that little clamp wherever it went, I had so many things on the go here. I <laughs> don't know where I place things. Here it is here. Um, with this, this will probably be, if you already have a camera, this will be your biggest investment, $79. Yep. So, um, yeah. And you can actually mount that right to a pair of binoculars as well. Right, Paul? Like, uh, yes, you can. Um, mount that to a binoculars yep. on a tripod and you could, you know, take some nice, uh, daytime shots if you'd like to. Absolutely. There, Absolutely. there were a couple of questions here. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah. Rob Dara asks, how much does the focus change? And I'm not sure when his comment came in. I think it came in a little while back, so I'm not sure uh, in what part he's talking about. But okay, maybe, I'm, maybe it's effective when you take out your take IPC. Out the camera? Yeah. 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 So basically, um, it changes. It changes a fair bit because if you've got a diagonal which is what this is, when you've got your eyepiece part in the, in the telescope, well, the light path goes into this from your telescope, and then it hits a mirror that's in the bottom of this. You can see that there's a little mirror down there. And so it hits that mirror in the back, and then it bounces up through the other side up to the eyepiece. So when you take this out of the telescope, you have to make up for this distance that's not there anymore. Mm. So usually you have to um, rack it out a little bit because your camera's sitting here, but the focal point, if this was straight, would have been back here. Mm. So that's all you're, that's what you're making up for, is, is the loss of distance, that's all. So um, so basically that's what you would do. Now, if you're using a focal reducer, it's gonna come in because your focal length is getting shorter. If you use a Barlow, in other words, the magnifier to make it twice as big, well then your focal distance is gonna go out further. And in some cases you have to use extensions, which is just like a, a tube that'll push it out further, so. But yeah. if you leave it, uh, if you leave the um, um, uh, the uh, diagonal in, but take the eyepiece out and put it right into the diagonal, well, then it's not going to change near as much as if you took the, the diagonal out and everything out, because you can put your camera right into the diagonal. The reason I, I say don't do that is because there could be some dust and dirt that's on the mirror, and it's another optical surface that's got a light has to bend and get to get to your sensor, and you'll always get a, a, a better... Um, uh, image if you if your diagonal is not true you'll get a better image just going right straight into the telescope mm. right yeah. great so there was another question here michael stewart asks uh, would you always remove the complete eyepiece when using a camera and t-ring a nose piece in uh, thinking of the risk of the camera falling out uh, of the mount from the telescope good question um uh, uh, uh yes you uh, the best way to do it is yes but I wanted to, I don't know if I can show you here on this telescope or not, but, uh, you know, we're certain as well as you are, uh, Michael, about uh, concerned about dropping our cameras. And uh, most of these cameras, uh, any kind of good focuser on a telescope is going to have a really good compression ring system on it. And there's usually three points on that compression. So what's on the inside instead of just these screws that are coming out that are grabbing 
um, your nose piece, it's actually a ring that goes around it. So when you crank those up, it's a brass ring that grabs that camera. And I defy you to try to even pull it out of the, of the telescope with all your might. Because once that's locked in there, if it's a good focuser, it's not going to come out. You're going to move the whole scope. And that camera's still going to be intact. So I'd feel pretty good about that if I took the diagonal and everything out. If I didn't take the diagonal out, then and if I'm going in this way, well, then, you know, I would be kind of careful because let me just see if I can do this for you and show you. So if I took, um, what do I do with that nose piece? I know it's right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in the camera. Come on, come here, come here. Sorry. Excuse me. So here's the nose piece and here's the camera. So basically now that's locked in, right? So it, that's never going to come off. Once you've got that, providing you've got the right T ring and you got a good quality piece, nose piece. And these nose pieces are like 20 bucks. They're not expensive. T ring's about $20. So to rig up your camera like this, you're probably talking 40 to 40, $45. That's all. So it's not expensive. But once I put that camera in that telescope and I lock those rings, I don't want to pull too hard because I don't want to pull the bearings on the, <laughs> on the focuser. That's not going anywhere. That's solid as a rock or Gibraltar. Mm. So, um, and that would be the, the best and the safest way. But to do it the other way, which would mean um, putting it right in the diagonal. So let's say that we, we had this. So as so long as your diagonal is good, because what happens with these, um, the nose piece that's, that's, that's on the front of the diagonal, sometimes they can get a little loose. So what happens sometimes is your camera might just fall to one side or the other. I've never seen one fall out, but they can sort of fall around. So when you put your camera, you still do the same thing. You put it in there just like you would an eyepiece. So there it is. So that's how it would look going through the diagonal. So if you did it like that, then you wouldn't have to make as much or as, you know, as much of an adjustment because you haven't changed the focal length that much. You're, what you've changed is where your eyepiece, where your eyepiece comes to focus would probably be a little different to where your sensor is back there because you got to make the focal point right on the sensor. But it's, it wouldn't be near the adjustment as if I took that right out all together because then I have to compensate for this as well. So I hope that answers the question, uh, Mike. I think it does. Just checking here. I just typed if anybody has any more questions for Paul before before uh, Paul ends up. I'm just watching uh, comments here on YouTube and Facebook uh, to see if there's anything else. And I haven't seen anybody uh, request uh, any more questions. So uh, okay. good, good to know. Thanks. Yes, uh, Michael. Michael said so. Yes, it did answer his question. I guess Pat, right. Pat Bacon asks uh, or mentions. Wow, one would almost think Paul was enthous enthusiastic about what he does. Yeah, almost. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. Give the man a mic. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready to go. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, Paul. Okay. Anything great. else you want to add, or yourself? Uh, no. Um, other than that, like I was, I was going to show some pictures and stuff, but we we'll do that at another time when we're talking about settings and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Great. Well, that's wonderful. That's a uh, that's a very interesting talk. Lots of lots of ideas there for people who want to get out and, and snap a photo for sure. Paul does have, as as you mentioned, maybe a maybe one or two photos that he could probably share. <laughs> <laughs> if you've been on his uh, Facebook page and you're on Facebook, it's uh, just look him up, uh, Paul Owen, and you would be amazed at uh, the quality of stuff that he does. Okay. So I guess from there. Um, you're going to set up for Rosanna's fun fact, I think, Paul? Yeah. Okay. In the meantime, maybe what I'll do is I'll try to get uh, these few photos that I have available. Oh, good. So um, I did, um, I should mention again that uh, our address is the Sunday, uh, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. Just that's all one word, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And if you'd like to send in your photos, I do go in and check on them. I did uh, actually receive eight photos for tonight that we're, we'll uh, we'll take a look at and bring them up here. But uh, yeah, bring it, bring your photos ahead to me at any time, and I'd love to be able to uh, to focus on them. So let's uh, see if I can share my screen now. Okay. And I'll see how I work out with this um, as far as both screens go. Okay. Let me share this one. 
And I gotta make sure that I'm clicked on myself, I think, over here. No, okay. It's not going out on the other one. Hang on, there, this is the one I want. There, okay. <laughs> two monitors with two broadcast softwares running on two of them, two laptops at the same time, and I'm trying to watch both channels, so. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to look at, I'm all set Chris I'm not I, I, you do your thing okay. but I'll I'll look at uh, your Facebook one for you. Okay great. So I'm um, just going to bring up a few photos that were sent to me. Here's uh, one that Alec Gordon sent in. Alec is a member of our local club. And uh, he did a capture last night of uh, our waxing crescent moon there with brilliant Venus off to the right hand side and the Pleiade star cluster just above it. Made a perfect little triangle there last night. So hopefully you had a chance to get out and take a view at that last night. I guess here locally, at least, we're going to be, oh, at least three or four days uh, before we get a, a clear sky again. But it was an amazing sight there last night. Here you have the uh, the moon, the second brightest object in our night sky, and Venus, the third brightest object, off to its uh, right-hand side. They're almost parallel with it. And then just above it, the, the Pleiades, the beautiful Pleiades star cluster. Now, here's where you want binoculars right here, because uh, binoculars are beautiful on the moon. Uh, and with Venus, we would actually uh, probably, well, you'd have to be magnified a bit more, I guess, to be able to pick out the, that, uh, the phase, but it certainly is very brilliant uh, through a set of binoculars. And then the Pleiades star cluster above it there, it's about 440 light years away. It's got over a thousand stars, I guess, but uh, with our naked eye, we can see it appears to be almost like a, a little mini dipper sitting here. Um, and it's very apparent in our evening sky uh, if we were to look at the... Uh, constellation of Orion, and you see the three stars that make up his belt, well, that would be off in this direction, off in the the, uh, the, the eastern part of the sky. You follow those three stars up until you hit uh, Aldebaran, one of the stars in Taurus, and then farther on from that again, you'd see this, this cluster of stars right here, the Pleiades. Very beautiful uh, cluster to be able to witness. Um, last night, I, I was able to pick it up pretty clear. Uh, the sun was, or the moon was almost a uh, getting down close to the horizon before the Pleiades really uh, popped right out really nice and clear because you need some contrast there with the dark sky and behind it, of course. But uh, we were able to get that nice view um, this week now. What is coming up, though, on April the 3rd, and uh, that's, I guess, what's today, the uh, 28th or something? April the 3rd, uh, sorry? 29th. 29th, okay. So just in a few days' time, uh, maybe we'll have clear skies here, just really hoping so. But what's going to happen is Venus here is going to be sitting right up inside the Pleiades star cluster. So uh, over the next few nights, it's going to creep its way up this way. Um, and then we're going to see it sit right in here to the left-hand side of the Pleiades cluster. So uh, what an opportunity for a photo, of course. But I don't know, Paul, uh, how difficult that would be with bright Venus sitting inside the Pleiades. Um um, it, it can be done. You just have to take a couple of different uh, shots of it, that's all. And just uh, superimpose them, I suppose, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's there's an, there's an opportunity there that's going to be... Uh, that only happens, I think it's every eight years, something like that. So it's not it's not very common. Um, so if you get an opportunity for a clear sky in your area on April the 3rd, uh, even on the 2nd, you're going to see it fairly close. It's going to be sitting just here, just below the Pleiades cluster, but by the 3rd, it'll be sitting directly inside that cluster. Well, of course, it's not sitting inside it. From our point of view, it's sitting inside it. Venus is only uh, uh, well, 50 or 60 million light years away, or a million years away, uh, a million kilometers away, sorry. <laughs> a million years. <laughs> okay. Watching too many screens. Um, and, uh, of course, this is 440 light years away, so it's going to be superimposed over the top of it. But still, very nice uh, opportunity for a photo here. Uh, of course, the moon will be up and out of the way by that time. The moon rises about an hour later each night, so it'll appear way up uh, in the top part of that uh, picture. But uh, that, that'll be a really nice shot. Anyway, let's go on with another one. Um, our next photo is uh, from Ben Brame. Hopefully I'm saying your name there right, Ben. Uh, ben sent me these a uh, couple of photos. He said, hello, I, I was watching your live uh, show. Um, I'm sending you a picture from my Nikon Coolpix P900. Um, and the Terminator on the Copernicus crater is right in the middle of the picture, which it is. Uh, very nice. He took these uh, pictures in Toronto in June of 2019. So there you are, downtown Toronto. 
with all those lights and look at the beautiful moon. Wow, nice. Yeah. The Copernicus Crater has a 93 kilometer diameter and 3.8 kilometers depth. So let's take a look at the other one that he sent us along with that. Here's the second one. So there's, there's Copernicus right there. 93 kilometers in diameter and 3.8 kilometers deep. We were talking about this last night. Um, the amazing depth of these craters. You're talking about something that's 93 kilometers in diameter and 3.8 kilometers deep. So, again, stretched out between us and uh, Moncton pretty well. Wow. And it's 3.8 kilometers deep. So, you would, yes, you'd notice that you're going down inside a hill <laughs> and <laughs> coming out the other side on the other side of Moncton or, or, or close close to Moncton. But, I mean, you really wouldn't realize probably that you're inside a crater. Uh, if it's that if it's that large, right? Mm -hmm. So they appear really small here, but of course they're 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 quite big. And there's a nice uh, Apennine mountain range there too. Beautiful. And the site of Apollo 15 was it right in there? No, 50. I think it was 15. No, was it? Uh, which one was it? Hadley Rills. That was uh, Apollo 12, I guess. In here, Emil might know. Anyway, that's another another beautiful shot. Thanks for those, Ben. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, and Irene Doyle here sent in a few photos for us. Um, Irene captured uh, the moon at the Grand Manan Weir. Oh, beautiful. Isn't that nice? Wow. Really well done. Yes. If we can magnify that one up, up a bit, might be able to. Here we go. Yeah, what a nice shot. That moon over the over the water there is always amazing, isn't it? I mean, oh, you, you, you've got to overexpose the moon, of course, a little bit to get that that brilliance of, of uh, the moon on the water. But what a nice photo! And there, and there's an example of like Paul said, you know, get some surroundings, get some landscape in the shot there with you. But really nice. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Irene. Uh, she's got a few more here. Um, she also sent me this one here. Um, which is the, uh, oh, nice Aurora. Aurora, sorry, yeah. Uh, trying to find it where it was. Two Northern Lights, 2015 or 2017, she says. These were taken. Just two shots of that. Here's another one. Very nice. I'm going to go back and see if she's, uh, com see if she's commenting here in, on the live feed. Robert's there, okay, and I'm just looking on Facebook to see if she's on there, maybe. No, okay. Uh, no, I didn't see her on Facebook. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, anyway, uh, we're up there, and we've got the the uh, we got the uh, photos up. So let's uh, let me go back here again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, one more second. Here we go. We've got a couple more photos that she had taken oh, you of. Uh, oh, did you already say it? But did you you saw the Big Dipper in that one, eh? Oh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. I there's, guess we are. Uh, there's Mysar and Elcor mm. right there. Right and there. because the stars right there. are uh, yeah. bloating, you can actually see the two stars. Fantastic. That's, that's cool. Let's, let's zoom in a bit. So, yeah, right over there. There they are. There's the two together. Yeah. Mysar and Elcor. And you can pick those up. Uh, a lot of people can see these naked eye. Apparently, yeah. it's, it's, it's a test of good vision. I've never been able to see them naked eye that close together. But certainly through binoculars, you can certainly pick out the two of them there. It's uh, mm -hmm. They're not a double, it's not a double star, it's an optical double, so one sits quite a distance behind the other. I guess it's kind of an argument about that a bit, but whether it is an actual uh, binary system or, or just an optical double. Mm -hmm. But uh, really nice, and of course, if we go take these two stars up here, we'd end up with Polaris right up around here somewhere. Right out of the way that uh, Polaris should be right up in here. Can't get it from the photo anyway. They're a really nice shot though, beautiful. Um, she also sent me these two from uh, Comet Pan Stars back in 2013. So here's one. Oh, it was a, a nice ion tail oh, there. Wow. wow. And here's her second one. Comet Pan Stars, 2013. Fantastic. Nice. Very nice. So thanks so much, uh, Irene and uh, Ben as well and Alec uh, for all those shots. Um, Again, folks, uh, the address is, I uh, just want to be sure I don't close us out. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get a little happy here clicking clicking the pictures. So I just want to be sure I get them all without closing out us. Here, and that's that one, and that's that one, and that's that one, and I'm going to stop from there. Yeah, whew. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, that's a great group of photos. Thanks so much, folks, for, for uh, including them. Uh, 
again, I'm going to just close these two out and get them out of the way. And uh, it's the Sunday Astronomy Show. Let me uh, try minimizing. Wait, no, I mean, I'm not going to go. It's just Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. It's all one word. So that's, uh, that's where we find it. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing here now. Um, just before you do, uh, Emil sent a little uh, note in. Okay. And uh, he's almost got his 110 objects. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, he's got uh, right up to, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven objects is what he doesn't have checked off on his list out of the 110. Wow. Oh, eight, eight, eight. That is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of work. That's wow, that Emil. is that's incredible. Congratulations. Um, that is amazing. That is that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy amount of work. And I know uh, Trudy Allman is working on it as well. Like, uh, um, I think Trudy's in Rask now, a Rask member. I know Emil is. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're uh, we're all members of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter. So we're amateur astronomers. The, the society uh, has over 5,000 members across Canada. So, uh, there are a lot of professional astronomers in it. There's a lot of astrophysicists in it. There's a lot of guys just like us in it. Um, and we, we carry this end of it to, uh, uh, as far as the outreach goes to, to interest people into it. I mean, of course, Paul's heavily into astrophotography himself right now. I'm, I'm more into the outreach side myself. Uh, Mike's our uh, Mike, Mike Giver guy. He's he just uh, invents stuff and and uh, makes it all. So Emil's saying that was all in one night. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Messier the Messier <laughs> marathon. marathon. Right. Yeah. And you can only do the marathon at a specific time of the year. Right now. Mm. And uh, obviously he planned for it. Right. That's amazing, Emil. Congratulations. And they were all manual too. They're all uh, like they're all just targets. Nothing with computer uh, guided scope. These are all manual. So who's using the manual scope? Uh, Trudy as well. She's she's done really well. She's picked up a, quite a number. I'm not sure where she stands either, but um, it is it's a lot of work. Um, because he had them all framed out at particular times as well. Yeah. Uh, just that, uh, like he, I, I remember seeing his log sheet. He had, I think he posted that up there just a little while ago. And it was like 902, this object, 904, this one. <laughs> it was like, it was just he only had like a couple of minutes in between each one to catch every one to get that many objects in one night, right? Yeah. So but, but you know what? That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of knowledge of the sky too. It is. A lot of yeah, star hopping. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it, to prove that you're actually on that object too, to get that little bit of hazy, fuzzy patch there. And, you know, some conditions of the sky aren't quite right, but you get a star hop from one to the next to the next. And so you really got to know where you're looking, uh, star charts out, of course. And, and so you really got to know what you're doing when you're doing it. So when you've done that, that's kind of like a rite of passage. That really is, uh, that's, that's, that's a step up from, uh, from a uh, amateur astronomer to, to the next level for sure. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. fantastic. And, uh, sure makes you comfortable when you when you have that type of knowledge. Congratulations, Emil. That's great. <laughs> uh, okay, so from there, uh, we're going to go to, uh, I think we're going to Rosanna's Fun Facts, okay. are we? We're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're around at 9 o'clock. So. Yeah, so do you want to just do that part and then we'll call it a night? Um, unless you, you want to wrap up stuff and we can do, I can do the Rosanna we, thing next week if you like. Sure, we can do that as well. Whatever you like, Paul. Whatever you think. Well, uh, this one, this one's a, a little long, okay. uh, not long, long, but probably take me about eight or nine minutes to get through it. So, okay. Well, we can hold, we can hold on that. Where are we at? We're almost nine o'clock now. We are uh, yeah. just a little beyond. Okay. So let's, let's call that a night then for now. Cause we don't want to, we, we're trying to stay within the, the one hour time frame as much as we possibly can. We understand that people, uh, you know, we've, we've committed to that fact. So, um, we will hold Rosanna's fun fact for next week then. We've got that already. And uh, I got a, a brief talk here to talk about uh, comets as well. Uh, I wanted to get a, a little bit of talk in on uh, this, this comet that's coming up. Um, comet C uh, 2019 Y4 Atlas. It's a long name, I know, but it's, uh, there's a reason for that name. And I can get into the explanation of that reason. And uh, right now, um, actually was discovered back in December of 2019. It was only at a magnitude 19. And now already it's at a magnitude eight, which and the number as the number gets lower, uh, the brightness gets higher. So since December, it's brightened over four thousand fold. Um, so it's almost at naked eye visibility, not at magnitude eight. It won't be. It's still able to be picked up with binoculars if you know exactly where to look for it, and uh, of course the telescope. But they are expecting it to brighten quite a bit yet. Now it's got a very diffused uh, coma, very diffused central point, so it's. 
it should be much brighter at its core right now than it really is. So we're not sure if it's going to break up as it gets closer to the sun or what's going to happen with it. But over the next little while, it's going to be up in the area of the Big Dipper um, and Cassiopeia, that type of uh, that piece of the sky. So I've got some star maps and star charts to show you uh, next week on, on where it's located, how to find it. And hopefully by next week, it'll it'll brighten up a, quite a bit. So it may be the the comet of the of the decade coming up here. Like we we've uh, it's been since Hale Bop in 1997 since we had a real good one. And uh, this one might prove to be that that one. Of course, they're they're completely unpredictable. Um, David Levy used to say comets are like cats; uh, they have long tails and they're unpredictable. So <laughs> it's just there's no truth uh, statement in that, but that's for sure. But we'll we'll try to get to that again uh, next week. So for now, folks, uh, we're a little bit after nine o'clock. We're trying to stick to the one-hour episode as we do, uh, were before. Um, Paul, thanks very much for everything that you've you've brought to the the table here tonight. It's excellent. Really appreciate it. Uh, folks, if you have any more questions, you can leave them here on, on the Facebook page or you can leave them on the YouTube in the comments section. If you're on YouTube, I ask you to please consider subscribing and uh, give us a like there too if you like. Uh, we, we enjoy that and uh, that really helps us move up the ladder a little bit. On Facebook as well, same same thing. Uh, we're trying this simulcasting. We'd like to know how it went tonight. If you had any issues with the with the broadcast itself, it was choppy or anything like that, let us know. Um, and we'll go back and review uh, what was happening here again. So again, um, we understand that we're uh, this is the only outreach that we're able to provide at the moment. All of our outreach has been canceled uh, at the at the IPs for obvious reasons right now. We we can't uh, have people at our IPs and stay our our social distance uh, away from everybody. But so, we're, but we are very happy that we're able to at least offer this online, and we're going to kind of try to continue to offer as many online um, programs as we can for the next little while. In the meantime, folks, I I, I know that it's scary out there. It's uh, everybody's full of anxiety, but uh, don't forget to look up because uh, it can help uh, take relieve a lot of that stress. And, and when you're looking up, uh, you're realizing how tiny we really are in the, the scheme of all of this. And uh, you know, this too will pass. It really will. And uh, we hope that uh, will pass a, a lot sooner than later. Of course, we're hoping back to you know in, in early June or whatever. We're not we're not looking at canceling any of our star parties at the moment, but we don't know where that's going to head. We just all have to wait and see where, where this all leads us, right? So just uh, wash those hands and uh, you know keep that social distance away and uh, be sure that you check in on your on your family members and stuff to make sure everybody's safe and everybody's okay, especially the elderly and and those uh, that are disabled around as well. Those are uh, a little bit less fortunate than the rest of us. So um, keep yourself safe, folks. Uh, uh, stay happy, stay safe, and uh, we'll check in with you all again next week. So thanks so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Paul, good night. Good night. And, and uh, keep your scopes Mike pointed tonight. up. Keep <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that for Mike tonight because he didn't join us, but That's we, right. Mike will be back <laughs> again for sure. So keep your scopes pointed up, folks. Take care. We'll talk to you all again soon. Good night. Just take me a little longer here, Paul. No problem.